Um, I also co-teach a studio at Pomona with Elizabeth Timmy. Um, and I, yeah, I'm excited to be at this event. Um, I'm not an expert in voting or voting rights or voting history. So I'm ready to learn a lot from all of you um, tonight. But I do strongly identify with the NOMAS mission and vision and values, um, which is why this initiative really resonates with me. Um, at LA Moss, we reflect our core personal values into our work and hold shared values as a team. So our vision at LA Moss is that communities of color have equitable access to the power and resources needed to shape their future. Yeah. So, our team is made up of many different backgrounds and expertises. We have design, policy, planning, financing, and this really enriches our work that we do. We have two co-EDs. On the left is Elizabeth, um, whose background is in architecture. And then on the right, we have Helen, whose background is in policy. Um, and so our mission is to create neighborhood-led initiatives that support the resilience and agencies of working class communities of color. Our work is based in LA, um, and it's founded in our mission and our shared values. So historically, we've had three areas of project focus that we've worked at, um, and all happened at the intersection of design, policy, and engagement. So pairing two, at least, or all three. Um, and that's where we find the most impacts in our projects. So one of our small, one of our uh, areas of work or focus um, has been small business support. So it's a program that focuses in supporting immigrant-owned, uh, women-owned, minority-owned mom-and-pop businesses in LA and providing technical assistance to improve their business operations and um, providing a storefront redesign under the identity of the shop owner. Another program area we have is our alternative affordable housing, um, which is currently our Backyard Homes project. So it focuses on designing, permitting, and incentivizing the construction of more accessory dwelling units, or ADUs, also known as backyard homes or granny flats. And the goal of the project or the program is to have homeowners contribute to uh, affordable housing right in their own backyard. So these are a couple of our pre-designed units for our affordable backyard homes program, where homeowners get to select and choose from preset designs that um, save them time, money, and also in these designs reflects the different characters and uh, around um, the multitude of neighborhoods in Los Angeles. And kind of rounding out our work is our public realm. So these projects focus on creating a more safe, accessible, and welcoming pedestrian experience along streets throughout Los Angeles. Um, we work in communities to design amenities in the public right away. Uh, and they meet their needs and uh, reflect their diverse identities and values. So this is our Go Avenue 26 project, which is in uh, Cypress Park, and it is a first last mile um, solution to increase kind of visibility and accessibility for pedestrians using low cost, high impact um, kind of measures or methods um, of creating paints and directionality in different surfaces of the public right away. And so I'm giving you just a very brief overview of all the stuff that we do. Um, and you can always follow up with me if you need more information. I'm happy to talk to you about any of our project areas that we were working in if you want to know more. They're all very, very dense um, and a lot of lessons learned. So we're always happy to share uh, when our projects work and when they don't. Um, which is also as exciting as, you know, our success is measuring where we can improve. So over the last year, LA Moss has actually been shifting from an urban design nonprofit to a community and place-based nonprofit with a focus in Northeast LA and more specifically in Frogtown or Elysian Valley, um, which is next to Dodger Stadium, if you're not familiar. And so what this means is that design is a process and a tool where we make information more accessible and make systems more inclusive. So in this new phase of work, design isn't our purpose for our projects. It's our tool that we use. Um, and our original plan was to transition over to, into an engagement process and a pilot program where we would co-design with our neighbors in Frogtown um, different sort of initiatives. And this was kind of back in January. 
And so when the emergency order for COVID-19 went into effect, we partnered with neighbors to launch a Northeast LA community response, which is kind of like a mutual aid um, initiative because we, we found that there needed to be more urgency in order to provide support for our neighbors. So we, with a group of 150 dedicated volunteers, we called over a thousand neighbors in Elysian Valley. We identified needs, we connected them with resources such as free food delivery, rent and mortgage information, unemployment filing and toilet paper. Um, we created craft kits to take care of, you know, that's a necessity also. Um, so in our kind of development of all of this, this stuff, in our collateral, in our written information, we uh, translated everything in English and in Spanish because our neighborhood is majority uh, Latinx and we believe also as a core value that language shouldn't be a barrier for accessing information. Um, so our community response now involved, it has involved into different programs or we're looking at doing that. And we know that delivering free food is important for people who are already living in tight margins because our community are, is working class. They are majority immigrants. Um, but it's a band-aid for a larger problem. Um, so for the rest of 2020, we're looking at co-creating projects that are not only reflective of, but that are led by the community, um, which is still kind of being resolved in how we do that. So it's, it's a lot of uh, us having conversations circling around, what is our purpose? Why are we here? What can we do? Um, which is very heavy to think about as we're also isolated <laughs> together. Or, uh, separate but together. Um, so we're going to be looking at these kind of larger systematic issues as to like why our neighbors don't have access to food. Why are they housing insecure? And so I think LA Moss kind of values centering the most marginalized voices in which is necessary to achieve to achieve a more just world. And I think voting is kind of a platform where you can be part of a decision making process and express your values. Um, I'm hoping that we're going to kind of do a Q&A because I know I went through a lot of that fast, but I want to do an icebreaker with everybody. So I'm hoping maybe we can get the Mentimeter going, um, shared in the chat and then also shared on the screen. Um, want you all to, you can turn off your cameras, you can close your eyes, whatever makes you comfortable. Um, I want you um, and that is kind of a fundamental belief uh, that you hold. You might still be developing it. You might have not thought about it a lot. I definitely didn't until I came to LA Moss. I had to do the process. So you can go ahead and open the Mentimeter um, link and it should send you to a page where you can enter your core value. So I'll give it a minute, but it should be populating on the screen as you enter in um, your own response. Thank you, Marco. And you could value integrity. You could value respect, like this person. It could be honesty. It could also be equity or justice. Um, and I wanted you to think about how that influences your daily life and where does it show up for you? Yeah. And if you don't feel comfortable with sharing, that's okay too. Kind of keep it in your mind. And I'll give it another minute. Looks like as a collective, we value equity. <laughs> Definitely respect. You see risk taking, professional safety, Compassion, quality, hard work. And I think we'll, we'll just take a few more minutes to let that populate, but I wanted to just thank you for contributing to this and also indulging me in an icebreaker <laughs> exercise. Um, thank you. And I think there is kind of power in being part of a voting process. Right. There's some of, we know that the system does or doesn't work in certain ways. And 
being able to know how the process works is a privilege. And I really want to thank uh, NOMAS for taking the time to share their knowledge with us tonight um, on voting in the local, which is very important, and national elections. And I'm excited to build our expertise together <laughs> as we can learn more about um, kind of the history and walking through all of these, these different things. So feel free to keep in putting your core values as we go. Um, but I think maybe we can open up for questions if you'd like. Yeah, sure. Uh, let's see. Here we go. About L.A. Moss. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any questions or does anyone want to talk about their core values? Yeah, that also that works. Love to hear that. I can talk about my core values. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Marco. Yep. Um, do you want to pull up the Mentimeter? Okay. Um, as you can see on the list, um, my three core values are respect, professionalism, and hard work. So um, first of all, for respect, I think this is one of the most important one out of the three. It should be kind of self-explanatory and it's kind of prominent in a lot of cultures basically respecting um, your parents, your elders, your professor, your mentors, and just generally respecting everyone. Um, second one, professionalism. This is something that um, my community college professor kind of drilled into me. It's basically, it's, it's like a general umbrella term that's got like a lot of subcategories. So basically um, being on time, being early, like dressing properly, um, having proper presentation and delivery skills, being resourceful, connecting with peers and all of that. Uh, lastly, it's hard work, another pretty self-explanatory um, value, basically being engaged in the conversation, always being dedicated to something, working hard towards your goal or what you're passionate about. I think um, as long as you work hard, you can go a long way. So yeah, those are my three core values. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Thank you, Marco. Does anybody else have any uh, any more questions for Chaz? No? OK, well, thank you so much for coming today, Chaz. Um, all the stuff you shared, like this is super interesting stuff. And we're really looking forward to um, hosting you for um, well, Henry takes care of that. Yeah, we would just like to thank Chaz for coming here today. Like, we, we very much appreciate what Elimas is doing for the community, and we hope to see you again. Thank you all for having me. I'd like to say thank you to Chaz and to L.A. Moss for participating with us this term and running the studio. I'm really looking forward to seeing the outcomes. I want to hear more. Please invite <laughs> me to your reviews. Yes, please come. <laughs> Everybody is so great. All the students are very impressive. I'm blown away by all the work that they do every studio. We do have awesome students. I'm sorry to brag a little bit. <laughs> no, brag. Do it. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. We're also going to have a, um, a virtual tour, uh, actually a, a, a firm crawl with Chaz uh, pretty, pretty shortly. Um, probably sometime actually in spring. So we'll have a sign up sheet for that if you guys are interested in what they're doing. Um, but without further further ado, um, George, would you like to say, say anything else? No, I think I'm good for now. I'm, okay. I'm here just to hang out. Um, Lauren, just, uh, Lauren and I were at a LAAIA meeting about similar concerns. So um, I'm just checking in and and she was supposed to be here, so I'm here in her stead. Okay, thank you, George. Uh, so let's, uh, I'm gonna kick it off to James, um, but before we do so, this is a disclaimer. CPP NOMAS is only here to inform, we are not here to influence. And uh, James is gonna go over um, some voting information for, for y'all, so enjoy. Thank you, Henry. Thank you, uh, thank you. So I just want to go into the history of voting real quick. Okay, so in 1789, after the Revolutionary War, 
uh, James Madison wrote the Constitution, which essentially created the government that we still have today. So after leaving a monarchy, America had decided that voting and electing government roles was the most appropriate choice for this new government. So while the Constitution does dictate how often an election should be held and what those qualifications are, they kind of chose to explicitly not include the right to vote. So originally, only property-owning, tax-paying white males had the right to cast their votes. And then as we go along in history, we're going to know that we have made some really exemplary strides into changing uh, who can vote and who has the right to vote. Um, next slide, Henry. OK, so the first one that came around was the 1870 15th Amendment. So after the Civil War, there was a set of three amendments that ensured that we're gonna have equality of African-Americans in the South. So the 13th abolished slavery, the 14th granted citizenship, and the 15th outlawed discrimination in voting rights. Um, this is a photo of Thomas Mundy Peterson, who was the first African-American to vote. So while um, we did uh, grant, or at least we prevented the discrimination of race in voting, there was still a lot of voter suppression. So there was literacy tests, poll taxes, intimidation, and also the grandfather clause, which was all put into place in order to try to find a loophole and prevent African Americans from voting. Um, just so you guys know, the grandfather clause states that a man who can only can only vote if their grandfather had voted. So with people being, you know, freely like newly freed slaves, there was no way that their grandfather could have voted. And now that they weren't allowed to vote, their grandchild was no longer allowed to vote. Um, and then it really wasn't until 45 years later, 1915, that, that the grandfather clause was considered unconstitutional. Um, next slide. So also in classic like American fashion, due to the, the phrasing of the 15th Amendment, women were still not allowed to, uh, the right to vote. So starting in 19, uh, actually 1848, the women's suffrage movement, which was led by Elizabeth Cady Sands, was started in order to fight for the right to vote for women. Um, this was a really long battle and it kind of lost some, some movement. But around 1890, the National Association of Colored Women, led by Mary Church Terrell, Josephine Salone Yates, and Anna Julia Cooper, uh, really reignited the, uh, the movement. And it wasn't until 1920 that um, women were allowed to get the right to vote. However, I do want to recognize that even though, like, yes, women were allowed to vote, black women still had to deal with racism. So black women still had to deal with literacy tests, poll taxes, and intimidation. So they, there was still another battle that they had to deal with. Uh, next slide. So then the next one that came in was the Indian Citizenship Act. So in 1924, uh, we passed uh, an act that allowed um, Native Americans to be considered as citizens, which then, of course, allowed them to gain the right to vote as well. Um, the 24th Amendment came in, and uh, it said that any poll taxes were out of reason and really didn't belong. And they recognized that because of poll taxes that people were being discriminated against. And then later in 1965, we got the voting rights of 1965, which came about from the civil rights movement. And that voting act was really to ensure that the 15th Amendment um, was to be enforced. So it outlawed the discriminatory uh, voting practices adopted in many of the southern states after the Civil War. So the literacy test, the poll taxes, intimidation, all of that was completely <clears throat> taken out the window. And then in 1965, we lowered the voting age to 18 years old. Uh, next slide. And then more recently uh, came about the American with Disabilities Act, written by Robert Bergdorf. So Title II states uh, that there would be, that they would prohibit discrimination on the basis of disabilities in all services, programs, and activities provided to the public by state and local government. So this really just meant that any place that was government officiated had to allow proper access for um, people with disabilities. So, you know, prior to this, if there wasn't an adequate ramp or adequate um, allowance of space, then, you know, the people with disabilities weren't really like physically able to cast their vote. Um, next slide. So are you guys a first time voter? Before. 
Henry, take it away from you, please. All right, guys, so um, we're gonna do this one more time. Please take your phones out and scan for Mentimeter and I will share the results. Well, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> I was actually telling James earlier that it should be a landslide of uh, just first time voters. Still a very uh, even almost. Right, yeah. There we go, see? Either way, we still got a good amount. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I see that uh, there are a lot of first time voters and that's a good thing because James is gonna go over how to vote next. So, yeah, I'll let you take it away, James. Okay. Okay, so in order to qualify for voting, uh, you have to be a US citizen and meet your state's residency requirements. Some states do allow um, homeless people to vote. Um, for your address, they will typically either put the street that they're frequent, uh, frequenting or the park that they're staying at. Uh, you have to be 18 years or older to vote on or before election day and registered to vote by your state's voter registration. Uh, currently, North Dakota is the only state that does not require voter registration. And the second you're 18, you're, you don't have to do anything. You're good to vote. Slide, Henry. Next slide, please. Okay, cool. So first we're gonna check if you're registered. Um, next slide. So for almost everything that we're gonna be doing here, we're gonna be using vote.org. So um, on vote.org, you're gonna have a little box that says check your registration. Okay. And then, yeah, you're just gonna fill out your government name, your address that you're currently reciting, and your birthday, and um, let's see, next slide. And if you're registered to vote, you're good. You don't have to worry about this at all. You're totally fine for this next step. However, if you're not registered to vote, um, that could actually mean two things. Either the address that you put in and you're currently living in does not match with what the government has on file. So technically you're not registered under that location or you've just never have registered before. So this is what we're gonna get into real quick. Okay, so how to register. So again, on vote.org, after you do your check, uh, your registration, <clears throat> and it's, yeah, you're just gonna fill out the same information. You're gonna put your name, your address, your date of birth and all of that. And then you're gonna get this if you're not registered to vote. So um, there's two options, either to do it online or do it by paper and mail it. Um, it's the digital age, so we're gonna do this online. So you're just gonna click that red button and um, you're gonna have about four pages worth of information that you're gonna have to fill out about yourself. It's gonna ask you about um, where you're living, uh, how old you are, your social security number, um, your ethnicity. It's gonna ask you to fill out all that as well. Um, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think the next two slides are good. Okay, yeah, actually, wait, let's go back real quick. So uh, while you're filling this out, oh wait, one more, let's go one more forward. Okay, cool. So um, you can actually, on your registration, request to get your mail-in ballot. So you could just hit yes and that'll be what it is. Um, later we will go in after, uh, how to request mail-in ballot if you are already registered. Let's see. And then, yeah, so it's just gonna have you double check everything that you're putting into there. And then next slide. Okay, cool. So we are gonna be California like focused for this presentation, but we are trying to take into account that not everybody is in California who will be watching this. So just so you know, there are eight states that do not offer online registration. So if you or a family member or a friend are residing in Montana, Texas, Wyoming, South Dakota, Arkansas, Mississippi, New Hampshire, or Maine, you are going to have to physically print out your form and uh, either mail it into your city council or like drop it off physically. 
So for voter deadline, for voter registration deadline. So for California, you have 15 days before the election, but you know, the sooner the better. And that goes in for uh, either doing it in person, by mail or online. Uh, we do have another, I guess, like loophole to that. Like if you haven't been able to register prior to that date, you are able to go on election day and fill out a registration there as well to be able to cast a provisional ballot. Uh, and I'll talk about provisional ballots later on as well. Okay, so where do you align politically? So something that does show up on the registration, it asks you what your political preference is. So we're just gonna try to explain that real quick. So before we do that, let's, uh, let's take one more. I promise this is the last ment uh, Mentimeter. And I'm just gonna do a minute countdown for y'all. Wow, so we have uh, money, dangerous debate, government, messy, leadership, corruption, chaos, climate change, old men, <laughs> uh, unequal, unopinionated, leadership, power, vote, unequal. A few more seconds, still, uh, Oh, it's closing. All right. Healthcare should be for the people. That's a good one. Does anybody want to talk about um, their answers? Anyone at all? <clears throat> I can talk about I can talk about mine if no one else wants. Let's see. All right. Thanks, Corey. No problem. Um, so, I mean, this is mostly for the, you know, I'm glad we're on this topic right here because I feel like this is important. And it's mostly for the, the new voters because I feel like the, the veterans in here, we, we kind of got an idea of what, you know, as far as like how we vote and what, you know, what makes us go vote. But for you new guys in here, you know, if, you, if you're trying to get with this program, like I, you know, you just have to figure out what's important to you. So I don't expect anybody to have the same views as me. But there are many reasons why I feel personally obligated to vote in this election. So you know, my, my focus is on, you know, voting for a president that has an agenda, not only just for America, but for Black Americans also. One that believes in systematic racism and working towards ending it, you know, equal pay, raising minimum wage and leveling the economy by controlling inflation, you know, building the lower class while establishing the middle class and Last but not least, you know, how about them student, student loan forgiveness? <laughs> so, you know, these are all important to me. When I hear the words uh, politics, you know, and like who, who you vote for, like these are things that are important to me. This is what gets me up and gets me to the polls to go vote. And, uh, you know, I, I definitely want, uh, you know, a president that has the ears to the ground and is truly for the people, you know, so. Uh, in my perspective, out of the two, that's, that's going up as of right now, that's Joe Biden, but, you know, it could be anybody for you, of the two, but just, just have a preference and go take that preference and, and write it on that, um, you know, color in that, that dot or draw that arrow to who you feel like, you know, is good for you. And, um, but just make sure that you instill your own values in, in your candidate, you know, and you hold them accountable. And the way you can hold them accountable is by going out and voting every time not just for presidential, but for local also. So yeah, that's my spiel. That's awesome, Corey, thank you. Thank you for sharing. No problem. Is, is there anyone else that wants to share um, their answer for this, uh, this question? Well, if not, I'm gonna let James um, talk to you about where you align. Um, so there's this really nifty test online. It's called the political compass test. Um, if you guys have, you know, listening to the news or just seeing things online, there's a lot of terminology that might seem foreign uh, for you. There's Democrat, liberal, Republican, 
conservative, left wing, right wing, and it's just, what does any of this really mean? So the political compass test is super, super helpful in figuring out where you yourself align, whether you're more left leaning or right leaning or in the center or more author uh, authoritarian or libertarian. And it also shows you what um, leaders you might align with as well. Like, do you, like, would you have a coffee with Karl Marx or tea with Gandhi? Like, it, it, it's a really, really cool website and I highly recommend you guys checking that out. So <clears throat> political party. So political party is a team of politicians, activists and voters whose goal is to win control of government. Um, in shorter terms, it's a group of uh, people with similar ideologies and goals. So as of right now, we've mainly only really heard about the Republican and Democratic Party. So we're just going to show a quick video on what are the main differences between the left and let's say the Libertarian Party. Two, the role of the state. Republicans like the idea of less government interference and more free market capitalism, whereas Democrats think the government should be more present in our lives through things like deficit spending after a financial crisis to jumpstart the economy, more regulatory oversight, and so on. Three, taxation. Democrats stand firmly behind progressive taxation, so higher tax rates for those who earn more, whereas Republicans prefer less taxation in general, and perhaps even an eventual flat tax rate. Four, healthcare. Democrats like the idea of universal government-provided health care, whereas Republicans would rather let private sector companies be in the spotlight. Five, social safety nets. Democrats tend to be more generous when it comes to government assistance through various programs, such as food stamps, whereas Republicans want less of a burden on the taxpayer. Six, defense. Republicans are more willing to spend money on defense and law enforcement than Democrats, who prefer a more pacifist rhetoric. Finally, seven, national debt. In theory, Republicans are more debt averse than Democrats. However, both parties engaged in quite a bit of deficit spending over the years, as the US debt level of roughly $20 trillion proves. Yeah, so primarily the biggest difference between Democrats and Republicans is how they view the government and how much power they believe that the government should be holding. So yeah, Democrats most, uh, mostly believe that the government should have more power and um, more control in allowing greater assistance for the people, while Republicans would rather have the government step back and sort of have it be more of a self-reliant system. Um, but these aren't really the only parties that we have in America. We actually have a bunch of them, but we're only going to talk about five today. So the third largest party that we have in America is the Libertarian Party. Um, they also call themselves the Party of Principle. Um, they're economically conservative, socially liberal, and also and minimum government with maximum freedom. Uh, the Green Party is the fourth largest. Uh, they have left-wing ideology and they focus on peace, ecology, social justice, and democracy. And the fifth one is uh, the Constitution Party, which is right to far-right ideology. And it's based on the interpretation of the Constitution, Bill of Rights, Declaration of Independence, and the Bible. And so far, we've mainly only heard about Republican and Democrats. Like, I don't blame you if you haven't heard any of these other parties. And that's really just because of how massive Republicans and Democrats are. So for the Libertarian Party, um, about 230 people that align with the Libertarian Party hold um, an elected official um, position. Um, and that sounds like a lot, 230. But it's 230 out of 520,000. So 0.04% of all of the elected officials are the Libertarian Party, which is the third largest party. So as of right now, it's just really Republican versus Democrat. Um, so as I mentioned earlier about your mail-in ballot, so if you registered uh, recently and click that option that uh, asked you if you wanted a mail-in ballot, then you're fine. You don't really need to worry about this. But if that wasn't something that you did, we're just gonna show you how to request your mail-in ballot real quick. So, um, it's going to be vote.org again. It's going to be, uh, you're going to click on request by mail. And it's going to be the same screen where you put in your information, uh, your address, and your date of birth. Next slide. Please. And then it's going to send you an email. So unfortunately, like besides registering, there is no online way to uh, request a mail-in ballot. So vote.org is super, super cool because they're going to take your information and start filling out the application for you. They're going to email it to you and then you just fill out the rest 
And then it's going to be either you drop it off in person or you mail it in to request a mail-in ballot. And then this is what that application is going to look like. So um, for California, um, we don't really have a deadline for the application for a mail-in ballot. But when you submit it, um, your, it cannot be postmarked past the election day and received no later than 17 days after the election. And that kind of sounds confusing. How can my vote be counted 17 days after the election? So with how things are currently, there are, um, America is expecting a higher number of mail-in ballots. So most likely we are going to be getting um, a delayed um, election result due to that. So as long as you have it set in either day of election day, your vote will be counted, but I do recommend trying to get that in as early as you can. Okay. So when you get your vote, uh, your mail-in ballot, make sure you look for this seal on it, the official election mail authorized by the US Postal Service. So this is just gonna notify you that this is the actual like true ballot. So there's three reasons as to why your mail-in ballot might not be um, counted for. So the first one is just, it's not received in time. Um, the second one is that the voter signature on the back of the envelope isn't signed at all. And the third one is that the voter signature doesn't match what the government has on hand. So let's say three years ago, you just got your driver's license and they asked for your signature and you kind of just scribble in whatever really comes into your mind. But as the years progress, you're like, oh, let me try out this new signature that kind of represents me more. Um, if you sign the ballot with that new signature, it's not gonna count because that's not what the government has on hand. So make sure you look at um, any official government ID with your um, signature on it and make sure that you match the same signature. So also, if you're choosing to do vote in person, vote.org also helps you find your polling place. So yeah, you're just gonna click on the polling place lo locator. And then you're gonna click on the state that you're, going, that you're residing in. So California for us, for most of us. And then you're gonna type in your address. Um, as of right now, it is a little too early to figure out your polling place. Um, there's a lot of logistics figuring out um, large spaces that allows for social distancing so that way you can vote in person. So give it a few, like maybe a week or two more but the closer we get to election day, um, you're gonna have a definite area of where you're gonna be going to vote. Okay, so let's talk about your ballot real quick. So something that the states of America really like to take pride in is having their own identity. So for a majority of the states, uh, your ballot's gonna be a straight and simple bubble sheet that you're just gonna fill out. Um, California has something really interesting. Um, so on the left is a typical ball ballot form, but on the right is going to be California. And you don't really see any bubbles because California doesn't use bubbles to cast your ballot. Um, it's going to be these arrows. And to cast your ballot, you're going to have to connect a line from one side to the other side to signify what you're going to vote for. I'm not sure why California thought this was a good idea. It might be for either safety or it's easier to read or it's less likely to make mistakes while you're voting, but just be aware of what your ballot says and what the appropriate way to cast your vote is. Um, on the left side, it's super interesting how every state does try to have its own identity. Uh, Florida has this really unique way of voting. Um, typically, you'll get one large ballot where you mark everything and submit an entire like like basically a blue book version of it, but Florida decided that it wanted to be, I guess, Florida about it. So they give you this yellow sheet and as well as your yellow sheet, it's gonna give you a packet. Um, so you're gonna lay the yellow sheet down and the packet lays on top and it's gonna tell you where to poke a hole in order to cast your ballot. Um, I think this was either the last election or during the primaries, but because of that, they, um, a lot of votes didn't get counted because things weren't punched correctly. So if you're in Florida, you're probably most likely to expect a, either a California ballot or a regular bubble sheet. Um, and also we have our voting machine. So if doing it digitally is something that you want to do as well, then you could do that as well. 
Um, it's super simple. It's just you just tap on whichever one you want to vote and then you just submit it. It's really, really quick, really, really easy. Saves a lot of paper. Okay, so provisional ballots. So let's just create a scenario real quick. So it's election day. Um, your voting uh, place is, let's say, down the street from you, but you're at work. You're at work until seven and you're way across town and you're not able to make it to your polling place in time. So provisional ballots allow you to still cast your vote even though you're not at the correct polling place. Um, so it's going to be the same exact ballot that you receive as everyone else. The only thing is that it won't be officially like tagged with your name on it. Um, but it's a totally like still valid way to cast your ballot. Um, I do want to recommend that like please try to go to your polling place. It's much, much easier for you and for them as well. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, so what's on the ballot? So I know a lot of you have been hearing about how it's either Trump versus Biden, but there's actually going to be a lot more on your ballot than you think there's going to be. It's uh, measures, elected officials, as well as the president. Okay, so for this, we're just going to use this website, ballotpedia.org. Uh, Henry, if I could just share my screen real quick. Okay, there we go. So when you go to the link, it's going to take you to this website. Um, just for the address, I'm going to use Cal Poly Pomona's address. Uh, you're going to click view my ballot and then it's going to tell you what upcoming election is coming for November 3rd. So this is everything that you are going to be voting on November 3rd. Um, it's a little intimidating, which is why I highly recommend using Ballotpedia. Uh, for the most part, ballot measures uh, count county district attorneys, as well as the president, is what everyone's going to be seeing in California. However, we all do reside in different districts. So um, we have members of Congress, State Assembly District, Superior Court, but these will be specifically to your area. Um, so I just want to talk about the first three real quick. So ballot measures, um, measures are they're not entirely laws, but they are like new jurisdiction that we have in America. Um, the reason why we have to pay when we ask for bags at the grocery store was because a prop, uh, proposition passed, which allowed that to happen. But there's kind of a lot that we're going to have to be voting on. So let me just click on one randomly. Okay, let's do California Prop 21 Local Rent Control Initiative. So it's going to tell you here um, well, actually, when you receive your ballot, you're going to get a very basic um, term of like what's going to happen if the ballot passes, but that's kind of not really enough to know what is truly going to happen when it passes. So here, local rent control. So this vote supports the ballot initiative to allow local government to enact rent control and housing that was first occupied 15 years ago, with an exception for landlords who own no more than two homes with distinct titles or subdivide interest. What does that even mean? So we can go down here and see, read more information about what the ballot's about, but you know, I'm not gonna blame you if you don't wanna read all of this. So what I do recommend doing is coming down here to the support and the opposition. So in the support, it's gonna tell you a list of um, officials, part political parties, individual unions that are all uh, in support of it. So for this proposition, uh, exactly, Let's see, we're going to, well, Bernie Sanders is supporting it, the California Nurses Association is supporting it. And that alone can help you dictate whether or not you want to vote yes or no on this. Like if you are, you know, a nurse in California, maybe this is something that you think would either benefit you or your peers might think is something that um, needs to be passed. You can also go into here into arguments to try to get more specific information on what these propositions will do. And then we can also go into opposition. So here, Gavin Newsom is an opposition of it, which is interesting. Um, something that you'll see a lot is that a lot of Democrats don't really agree with each other and a lot of Republicans don't agree with each other. And then sometimes Democrats and Republicans do agree with each other. Um, let's see here. So yeah, Equity Residential doesn't support this. California NAACP doesn't support this. And if you're still confused, like let's say, I don't know, you're into the California Senior Advocates League, but you're also 
you know, a fan of the eviction defense network. Uh, yeah, just read the arguments and see like what what do you think truly matters and what really means something for you. Uh, so let's go back real quick. So then, yeah, so we also have our county district attorney. So um, Jackie Lacey's term is ending. She just, uh, she was nominated in 2012. Her eight year um, term is ending and she's up for re-election. And George Gascon is going up against her. But let's say you don't know anything about like, Jackie Lacey. Who is she? Like, what is she, has she done? So if you click on her name, it's gonna give you a like, a little rundown, almost like a little Wikipedia page of like what she's done. Let's see. This most recently, she won the primary election. Um, there was actually a recall effort for her in 2017. Uh, let's see here. So yeah, you should really, really go into this and try to figure out what what is what aligns with you more. As, as Corey has mentioned earlier, that what really is the right choice for you. Well, let's get into presidents real quick. So, I mean, as you can see here, there's more presidents running than, you know, or more nominees running than just Donald Trump and Joe Biden. So in all 50 states, Donald Trump, Joe Biden, Howie Hawkins of the Green Party and Joe Jorgensen of the Libertarian Party are gonna be in, yeah, all 50 states ballots. However, um, not every nominee is going to be the same in each state. So for California, we have Rock De La Fuente and Gloria Riva. Um, it kind of costs a lot of money to be nominated into a state. So a lot of, a lot of um, nominees sort of try to be state specific in order to try to get as many votes as they can. Um, but yeah, like we were saying earlier, how Republican and Democrats are so heavily focused in the election that, you know, there's four of the people that we can vote for. Um, so another option that we do have, oh, let me go back uh, that we have is to write in an option um, so let's say none of these are really your vibe. You're not really like messing with anybody, but you want to like put in a name. Um, I don't know. Let's just say that Billie Eilish is someone that you just want to throw in just as a little gag. But let's say in all of America, over 50% of everybody decides to vote for Billie Eilish. Um, it kind of doesn't matter because she didn't run as a write-in nominee. So when you do go vote or when you get your ballot, it's gonna give you a list of write-in options. So all of those people who are write-in options are eligible to win the election. So anyone's, anyone whose name isn't on there isn't eligible to win. So I do highly recommend going through this, really knowing what's going to affect you personally and what you feel like might even like affect your friends, your family, as well as that. Um, and let's go. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So how is the president elected? So I know a lot of you might have heard about how in the 2016 election, Donald Trump didn't win the majority vote, but still ended up president. Um, so how is that even possible? Uh, if you could go into the next slide. Okay, so let's talk about the Electoral College. So what the Electoral College is, um, what was created in 1787 as a compromise between electing the president by a vote in Congress or, and also electing through um, the population of the state. So um, it, it's kind of a system where citizens indirectly elect the president and vice president through a body of electors. Um, this is, I want to say, this is really confusing and really, really difficult to, to explain. So, okay, let's just talk about California specifically. So California has 55 members um, in the Electoral College. So two of them um, are members of Congress. Every state gets two members of Congress and then the rest of the numbers are comprised of the population. So with California being as big and dense as it is, we do have 55 um, electors. Texas only has 38, Alaska has three. And this was really just to try to create a system in which smaller states with less, peace, less people also get to have their voices heard in the election. So this is ultimately what the nominees are trying to win. They're trying to win the votes of the Electoral College. So in California, let's say um, the Democratic nominee wins the majority for California. So the president doesn't gain those votes. He gains the 55 votes of the Electoral College. 
And then let's say in Texas, um, the Republican uh, nominee wins over 50%, they get 38 votes instead of every vote casted in Texas. Um, so because of this system, um, it takes, it, the nominee needs to get at least 270 electoral college votes. Um, it's 270 because altogether it's 538 electors. Uh, half of that is 269, so getting over half would be 270. So a lot of the nominees would either target states with the larger um, uh, number of state electors, or they try to target a lot of small states in order to try to really like round up and get all those uh, numbers. Um, I do want to say that, uh, I guess a little fun fact, so just based on how this electoral college works, um, it's completely possible to get zero votes in 30 states, as well as the District of Columbia, and still win the presidency. Like in total, you only need about 11 out of 12 of the larger states to win the presidency. Um, so yeah, it's a pretty interesting way how we pick our leader. Oh, Henry, if you could take this. Sorry, am I frozen again? Oh, no, you're fine, you're fine. Okay. Daddy, are you going to make... Okay, cool. So we're going to have... Um, we really want you guys to take the initiative to vote. Um, oh, after like saying everything that I've just said, I just really want to stress that it's... Like so many people have fought for their right to vote. And so many people even now don't have the right to vote. Um, as mentioned earlier, I think that convicted criminals don't get the right to vote in some states. Um, US residents get to vote, but I mean, they don't get the chance to vote. They get to live here, but they don't get to vote. And a lot of the jurisdictions and laws really dictate what they're allowed to do here. And I just really wanna emphasize that a lot of the things that you're going to be voting on is what this like makes the decisions for them. And I know that this past summer has really shed a light on what the government is able to do and kind of chooses not to do. Um, I guess something that kind of might have affected a lot of you was the first, or I guess the only stimulus check that we've gotten so far. Um, if you are claimed by a dependent, you weren't eligible for that as well. And I know that was money that could have helped so, 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 so many of you. And then there's the issue of all the fires right now, how climate control is such a massive thing. And just the summer, how we... And I really want you guys to know that the people that are making decisions are chosen because of us. And it's really up to us to choose the right people to make the right choices in order to really make a better future for everyone who's living here currently and everyone who's going to be living here in the future. So um, if you could just bust out your phone one last time, um, it's going to be a, a link to pledge to vote. And I really want everyone here to understand why it's so important to vote and really spread the message on um, and create awareness of what you're capable of doing. Your voice really, really matters. And Use it, use it. Um, James? Yeah. yeah. Can I add something to that? Absolutely. Yeah, man. So what James is saying is very true, guys. Like this is a very, very important moment uh, in, in our generation's time. Uh, I, I feel like, you know, whether you vote or don't vote is detrimental to the United States. It's detrimental to, to everything that's gonna be happening within the near, the near future. Uh, to be honest with you, like, I don't know what else to, we don't know what else to tell you to get, to have you guys actually get motivated and get up and vote other than the fact that voting is literally like people died to give you this opportunity. People were oppressed to give you this opportunity. Voters oppression is real guys. It's still happening to this day, till this day. And one way you can defeat it is just by getting up and going to do it. Or just get online and just do it. Find that whatever it need, whatever it is that, like I was saying earlier, whatever it is that motivates you, whatever your values are, your core values, and and you want you want a piece of that to, to be installed into the president, uh, you know, of the United States where you reside. You know, you want to be able to complain, you know, and be like, oh, I don't like this, I don't like that. Well, guess what? 
you have that right if you vote. You can make that change. You know, so I don't, you know, if that doesn't motivate you to you guys to get up and go and do it, I don't know what will. But this is something very, very important. I cannot stress it enough. Well, that was awesome, guys. Thank you, Corey. I have goosebumps from that. <laughs> um, guys, if right now I want to, I want to thank you, James. Um, James actually put this whole thing basically together. Uh, he not only stood in front of you guys for 45 minutes, he actually put this whole thing together himself. Um, so if you guys can, if everybody could just turn on their cameras and give James a round of applause, I would really appreciate that. Um, we're going to take a screenshot and thank you, James. I couldn't have done it without any of you guys. You guys really, really helped me out with this. Um, I also wanted to thank um, the EMV Council, uh, the African American Student Center, the Asian and Pacific Islander Student Center, uh, all of SoCal NOMA chapters uh, for promoting this event for us. I want to thank you again, Chaz uh, and L.A. Moss. I want to thank George and Dean Bricker for uh, making everything happen for us. Uh, and last but not least, I want to thank you all for coming and like donating your time to be here and uh, helping us make a change together. Um, we actually have this SoCal NOMA vice president here. I'm not sure if she wants to talk. Uh, yeah, yes, I would. Henry, thank you so much. I want you guys to know that I was watching the debate and it was such a fiasco that I said to myself, I'm going to get on the Cal Poly Promona call about voting because I need some information. I cannot go through this and this event was much more powerful and much more informative i mean when you get off you guys are going to hear it on the news complete disaster complete waste of time and i got on at about 7 30 and the information that i have heard in the last 40 minutes is so powerful um, you guys have done an amazing job and I'm glad that this is being recorded, that we could put it up and share because just how to do it and where to go is so important at this time. Um, the president was spewing out how a disaster mail-in ballots were going to be and things like that. And just unbelievable. Um, and I'm probably voicing the way that I'm going to vote, but I don't really care because I cannot deal with what has been going on and I need a change. And I hope that people vote has been given to us, especially women and African-Americans. We did not have this option at one time. And so um, I encourage everyone, um, citizens, new citizens, any and everybody, please find out how you can vote. I know a lot of students are from someplace else. Um, so you might have that um, to contend with, but get to your state, get to your information, do whatever you need to do to get um, educated. And the information that you guys shared tonight, uh, phenomenal. You are doing a phenomenal job. Um, I thank you so much for coming in and being a part of uh, the National Organization of Minority Architects. You guys have been setting um, I, I just can't say how high of a bar you are setting for the other chapters. Um, and we definitely appreciate um, Henry and the teams and your leadership and everything that you guys are doing at Cal Poly. Thank you so much. And bye-bye. <laughs> bye-bye. Thank, Thank you guys so much and have a great night.